tonight on CBC Vancouver News. So today I'm announcing we are reintroducing a mask requirement. Masks are back in BC, where you'll need to wear them and why also. In this case, you just have too many homes on fire. Um, so you have to go after the ones that you can save. Destruction and devastation, touring a community ravaged by wildfire and. If you've had an outstanding time, anywhere from 20 and beyond is wonderful. The age old debate to tip or not to tip how the pandemic has changed our habits. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening and thanks for joining us. Well, masks are back in BC. Starting tomorrow, the face coverings are mandatory across the province. Dan Burrett joins us live on our top story tonight. Okay, Dan, so some say they should have never gone away in the first place. Others not happy the mandate is back. Either way, we'll have to wear masks in public indoor spaces. Who does this apply to? Everyone 12 and older in BC, Anita, once again. And it takes effect tomorrow as COVID cases keep rising. Get ready to put a mask back on if you go into a grocery store, city hall, a restaurant, a pub, ride public transit, get in a taxi or a ride share, or go, in, go into an office building where public services are offered. BC dropped its indoor mask rule only in July, but COVID cases began to rise soon after. Dr. Bonnie Henry says the order will be reviewed in mid-October when BC's vaccine card is in full force. She says the abrupt return to indoor masking now is another layer of protection as we head into autumn and spend more time indoors. We'll be watching whether uh, influenza comes again this year, whether we have other respiratory viruses that they're starting to see in other places. So these are all things that we are adapting and changing as we're going through this pandemic. The province says unvaccinated people currently make up 90% of COVID cases in our province and 93% of hospitalizations. Essentially, you're 10 times more likely to get infected if you are not immunized. People we spoke with today say they're generally fine with the return of the mask mandate. Now the virus is mutated and I'm just going to trust what Health Canada says. I got my mask ready to go. I, I think it's necessary to be uh, safer. I don't know if I believe that they're actually of any use at all. So I'm kind of against it. That what is the harm in wearing it? You know, you're protecting you and uh, you're protecting other people. Um, and if the cases are getting really bad again, I think it's important for everyone, even if you are vaccinated, to wear your mask. Okay, Dan, and we know frontline workers from, you know, grocery store clerks to retail staff have had to deal with a lot of people who don't want to follow the mask rules. So what do businesses make of this abrupt change? Good question. Uh, Greg Wilson with the Retail Council of Canada says Dr. Henry spoke with business leaders yesterday about the vaccine card plan, but didn't mention the return of the mask mandate. He's concerned it puts a burden back on those staff and business owners, and he'd rather have the province mandate vaccines. I'm mostly concerned with the frontline employees, the store operators and employees who have to deal with those customers who are going to tomorrow be a bit cranky, some of them, about having to put the mask back on. Other businesses, meanwhile, are handing out laughs along with warnings. False Creek Ferries tweeted out this, saying, as of tomorrow, you have to wear a mask on board. If you don't, don't want to, you can swim, but don't give our crew any guff or you will walk the plank. So if you go to a store tomorrow, get on that ferry. Don't forget this. Again, Anita. Fair enough. I've got mine handy. Thanks, Dan. And mandatory mask wearing is coming to BC schools as well. For the most part, the province has laid out its back to school plan and there are some noticeable changes from last year. As Joel Ballard reports, that's left some saying the new policies fall a little short. Students are headed back to school full time and in person, granted with some rules. A requirement for all K-12 staff, as well as students from grades four and up, to wear a mask in indoor spaces. That means gyms, hallways, libraries, classrooms, and on the school bus. Officials say it's an important step both for students' education and their mental well-being. A big component missing in the new plan compared to last year is the cohort system, and that opens the door for extracurricular activities. We are not in the same situation this year as we were heading into last September, because we now have safe and effective vaccines that we know 
protect us from COVID. But not everyone is thrilled. We are incredibly disappointed that we're going back with what seems to be like less measures uh, with the Delta variant going strong. A particular frustration for the Safe Schools Coalition is the exclusion of kindergarten to grade three students from the mask mandate. Kids under 12 are not vaccinated, and we are seeing the rise in numbers there. The BC CDC says the Delta variant leads to more cases in children, but the outcomes remain the same as with other variants. And officials are confident in the plan. The most important thing we can do to protect them is to make sure that the adults around them are immunized. In North Vancouver, the Sunil family is preparing to send their son to grade one. They too were disappointed with the lack of a mask mandate for his age group. We are definitely feeling very anxious about this. Um, and especially like this is the time of the year where we need to feel really confident sending our kids back to school. For many months and again today, health officials have said it's difficult to enforce mask mandates on young children. But the Sunils say it's become almost second nature for their child over the course of the pandemic. The family says the mask mandate wasn't the only thing missing. Mandatory vaccination for members of the uh, school system uh, is something that uh, is one of the things that we were definitely hoping to see, um, especially uh, given that uh, the, the more people uh, that are vaccinated uh, in the school system, the better it is for everybody. Dr. Henry said her team will continue to reassess and adapt. Some of these families and teachers hope that happens sooner rather than later. Joel Ballard, CBC News, Vancouver. And tonight we're learning 90% of COVID-19 cases within Surrey schools originated at home or in the community, not in the classroom. Fraser Health's study looked at transmission data from January to June of this year. Staff accounted for 11% of COVID cases and students the rest. Transmission at school was limited even when different variants were circulating, but it doesn't include the Delta variant. So the health authority says it will be closely watching when kids return to the classroom next month. And there have been 641 new cases of COVID in BC in the past 24 hours. And this has pushed the province's rolling average to go above 600 for the first time since mid-May. There have been no new deaths. After yesterday's announcement of the BC vaccine card, however, more than 5,000 people got their first dose, and that's the highest in 19 days. But hospitalizations have doubled in the past two weeks, up to 138 today. 78 people are in intensive care. Interior Health is apologizing for giving more than 500 people invalid doses of the COVID-19 vaccine. The doses had been stored in the wrong freezer, but the health authority is maintaining the invalid doses are not a risk. None of the people who got the, the, those doses have gotten the virus. Each of those people is now being contacted to rebook another shot. Meanwhile, there's growing concern among those who can't be vaccinated because of medical reasons. Lee Iliasson suffers from a chronic illness of the nervous system and says she should be exempt from BC's passport system. I now cannot accompany my own family uh, to any event that we wish to choose, any restaurant, any, you know, I'm now an out, uh, I'm essentially an outcast in my own family. Dr. Henry says there will be no medical or religious exemptions to BC's vaccine card period. Layson is hoping the province will reconsider. Proof of vaccination will also be required for on-campus housing starting September 7th. Today's announcement also, uh, in a way, did leave uh, more questions than answers for a lot in the university community, um, especially around um, academic settings like lectures um, and other classrooms. Um, and sort of what that means for students, faculty and staff um, in those settings uh, going into the September year. UBC says those living in campus housing will be required to show proof of the vaccine a full week before BC's passport comes into effect on September 13th. Well, days after a fire swept through a neighborhood on Okanagan Lake, we're getting a look at the dozens of homes lost in the fast-moving flames. Brady Strachan went inside the fire zone today where just a few meters meant the difference between losing your home and still having a place to return to. 
I'm here in the Estemont area on West Side Road. It's one of the areas that was most damaged by the fire here. As you can see, some homes behind me are just completely destroyed. The fire has burned right down to the foundations, whereas just meters away, there are other homes that are almost untouched by this fire. The fire came streaming into the neighborhood uh, late Sunday night a week ago. It was burning up in the hills and fire officials say winds pushed it down so quickly into the neighborhood here that they had to make decisions on which homes they could try to save and which homes they had to let burn. It's devastating for firefighters because they're used to putting fires out. If they see a fire, they want to put it out. In this case, you just have too many homes on fire. Um, so you have to go after the ones that you can save, and that's what fire crews did that night. Here we can see some of the extreme damage that is around us. This home was completely burned down to the concrete foundations, and we're seeing just what kind of heat this fire has produced as well. In some cases, we've seen recreational vehicles, campers that are completely destroyed, and on the ground you can see where the aluminum siding has melted and it's spilled out into long streams down, spreading across the ground. We're now looking at the Kalini Beach area. It's another neighborhood that was devastated by this fire. You can see that many of the homes are burnt right down to their foundations. Vehicles are destroyed. Uh, it's really a, a scene of destruction. Now, on Monday, residents were allowed back into the area. Officials brought in about 80 to 100 people who have lost their homes. Many of them, this is their primary residence. Others are people from out of town who have family cottages here that have been in their families for generations. The fire officials say the fire is still burning up in the hills, but rain and uh, humidity recently has lowered the uh, aggressiveness of that fire. But still, this area has a lot of uh, hazards. There's uh, power lines that are down. And because of that, it could be a very long time until people who still have structures to return to are able to get back into their neighborhoods. Brady Strachan, CBC News, near Killini Beach, British Columbia. And cooler temperatures over the last few days have helped fire crews make good progress on a number of major wildfires. We're starting to see some of the effects of fall come in to uh, um, help us. And uh, really what we've seen is, is more fall-like patterns than traditionally, say, August-like weather patterns, which has been very helpful for us in our operations. BC has averaged a decrease of four to six wildfires a day in the past week. There's still some concern in the Caribou and South Okanagan, though, because those regions haven't actually seen much rainfall. And the White Rock Lake wildfire is still burning out of control. Just this afternoon, more than 100 properties were put on evacuation order. There are still 63 evacuation orders in total and 24 fires of note in the province. Johanna is off this week. Amy Bell joins us now with the forecast. And Amy, it's looking like there's a little bit of that relief. It's going to continue, really, for yeah. crews, right? Yes. By the weekend, we will see some more warm weather. But by uh, tomorrow, we'll start to see a transition with more clouds and cooler temperatures coming in. And then Thursday, Friday, at this point, looking to be uh, much more wet for many areas of the province, which is certainly what we need. Could even see some showers in that Okanagan area where it's been incredibly dry. Taking a look at the fire uh, danger rating, we are seeing things just ramping up a little bit so we're still in the low area but we did see a bit more of blue the very low uh, yesterday so it doesn't take long for it to change once we have a sunny day and tomorrow will be another sunny and warm one for many areas and then we'll start to see that transition as we head into Wednesday night so uh, throughout the day as you can see it was a very calm we really saw zero precipitation for most areas except for a slight dusting in some areas along Vancouver Island and the north coast as I mentioned though tomorrow is when we start to see that transition with the clouds arriving in the day and then we'll start to head into the precipitation for Thursday and some of it will linger into Friday. So taking a look at our five day four or four day three, I'll get it right one of these days. Uh, 23 tomorrow with a high of 15 with that sun uh, disappearing later in the day and more clouds arriving. And then Thursday and Friday will be cooler and very wet, but we get back into the sunny weather for the weekend. All right. Thanks, Amy. You're welcome.
And welcome news tonight for BC's tourist sector. The marine border between this province and Washington state is set to fully reopen to vaccinated Americans in just a few weeks. It's a one-way arrangement with U.S. waterways still closed to Canadians. Some operators plan to restart with whatever sailings they're allowed to fill, but the lack of consistency is leaving others in the lurch. It's one piece in the puzzle. With us, we've said that until the south border opens, until the U.S. opens to Canadians, we're, we're not going to operate. Travelers from down south can enter Canada by boat starting September 7th. Well, it's the age-old debate, to tip or not to tip, and now what percentage do you tip? Half the Canadians say the social expectation to leave more money has gone up during the pandemic. And beneath Breach reports, hospitality workers say the extra cash is needed to help offset the losses experienced over the last year and a half. For this Vancouver server, the pandemic has brought in fewer tips and a more frugal lifestyle. I'd love to be able to continue activities that I might have been doing prior to the pandemic. Uh, but right now, it's just not really the, uh, viable for me financially to do that because tips are quite a bit less. Less money and the work is harder too, with an estimated 40,000 employees leaving BC's hospitality industry in the last year and a half. There's a labor shortage and staffing crisis like we've never seen. With all those challenges in mind, 48% of Canadians feel more pressure to leave a better tip now than before the pandemic. And 20% of Canadians think they will tip more than before, but 71% don't think they'll change their habits. Minimum tip should be 18%. If you've had a good time, 20%. If you've had an outstanding time, anywhere from 20 and beyond is wonderful. The pandemic has also inspired some restaurants to come up with new ways of tipping. We definitely noticed a shortage in back of house staff. And that's when Vancouver's taco joint Gringo moved to an equal pay and equal tip out system at the end of the week. In order to incentivize uh, people wanting to continue working uh, as well as uh, create equality amongst all of the staff. While the tipping focus traditionally remains front of house, Gould says the lack of tips on takeout orders means kitchen staff especially miss out on more tips. There's still lots of hands that, and labor costs that are involved in that, whether that's in the back of the house or the front of the house. For some, tipping expectations and practices may have changed, but this advocate says the pandemic has resurfaced the need to eventually abolish tipping and prioritize fair pay. What we're talking about is providing a livable wage for folks. And what that also means is that most hotels, bars, restaurants, cafes, what have you, all of these all of these businesses need to change their pricing models. Not a quick and easy change, she says. And for now, to help servers like Gould, she agrees a compassionate tip can go a long way. Beneath Brach, CBC News, Vancouver. The BC Supreme Court has stopped a road construction project in Surrey's Bear Creek Park. The extension of 84th Avenue from King George Boulevard to 140th Street was meant to ease congestion, but opponents say construction would cause harm to the environment. The project's estimated cost to taxpayers, $18 million. The court says Surrey can go ahead with some limited work pending a full hearing in October. Well, thanks for being with us tonight on CBC Vancouver News at 6. I'm your host, Anita Bath. And if you're not already doing it, you can always watch our program live on our free app, CBC Gem. You can also catch us on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. Desperate to get out, we touch base with an Afghan Canadi with Canadian Connections who was airlifted to safety. Next. Thank you for staying with us during our commercial free live stream. Zara Rutherford is gaining is gunning to be the youngest woman to fly solo around the world. Yesterday, the 19 year old touched down in Happy Valley Goose Bay in Labrador. As Reagan Burden reports, the solo pilot was treated to a warm welcome. In only six days, Zara Rutherford has made the journey from Belgium to Canada, stopping in the United Kingdom, Iceland and Greenland. I just completed my first solo transatlantic, so I was really happy about that. But definitely some challenging parts with the weather, but I loved every minute of it. Zara, whose parents are pilots, has been traveling by plane since she was three months old. She began flying herself at the age of 15. Flying around the world has always been a dream, but one she thought might never happen. I always thought, you know, it's just 
too complex, too complicated, too impossible. I mean, it, it was never going to happen. So I didn't tell anyone. It was something I, I would think about, and that's about it. And then I decided, once I finished school, you know, if you didn't tell anyone, it definitely wouldn't happen. So I decided to tell my parents and you know, about my, this thing I wanted to do. And straight away, they, they were like, yes, let's do this. Apart from setting a world record, one of Zara's goals in this trip is to encourage young women and girls to start flying and pursue STEM careers. Growing up, I didn't see many women in aviation. So every now and again, I'd see a female pilot, but to be honest, they were quite rare. And actually looking, thinking about it now, I've never met a female instructor. So that was, for me, quite, you didn't have many role models. It wasn't, it was quite discouraging. And I mean, there's Amelia Earhart, who was amazing, but she passed away 70, you know, 80 years ago. So having her as a role model when you're eight is a bit tricky. Based on the reception that Zara received at the Lawrence O'Brien Arts Center, she is already inspiring young women and girls. Zara does have a special relationship with Labrador. In 2019, her father was flying a plane that crashed near Makovic, and yesterday she was able to meet one of the people who aided in his rescue. It's fascinating meeting some of the people that uh, saved him. I was very grateful <laughs> for bringing my dad back. And I actually flew quite close to the mountain where, where, where he, he yeah, crashed into. But yeah, it was really, really nice to see, finally meet the people and, uh, and be able to thank them in person. Zara is set to depart from Montreal tomorrow morning and aims to be back in Belgium in November. If all goes as planned, she will be the youngest female pilot to fly solo around the world. Reagan Burden, CBC News, Happy Valley Goose Bay. Evacuations from Afghanistan continue to ramp up, with Canadian forces helping to airlift more than 1,300 Afghans to safety in the last five days. Stephen D'Souza spoke with a family who will soon call Canada home. They're telling their story through photos, videos and messages they were able to send. The path to freedom for one Afghan interpreter went through this canal of raw sewage filled with razor wire. From far away Canada, Sangin Abdul Mateen has been trying for a week to guide his brother to the airport. Both worked as interpreters for the Canadian forces. But every time the family tried to reach the destination given by Canadian authorities, they ran into Taliban checkpoints and desperate crowds. It's thousands of people. Um, yes, adult will make it um, in, in a couple hours to, you know, in that crowd. But if you have a children and a small kid, it's impossible. They found an alternate route. It meant going through sewage. But on the other side, Canadian soldiers. So his brother Rangin waded in. That's him in the light-colored jacket. The moment I liked so much where my brother sends me the picture is that where the Canadian um, soldiers are holding their hands and trying to lift them up from the sewage water. That was the moment that made me cry. The next images brought a feeling neither brother had felt in weeks, relief. Then joy, seeing him aboard the C-17 on his way to Canada, with so many others weary from the escape. We are waiting for the Canadian guys. But for every story of success, there are dozens more of sorrow. That same sewage canal is now overrun, including by other Afghans who worked as interpreters for Canada. And we are waiting for the last three hours in this canal. At another point into the airport, cries of Canadian seemingly go unanswered. Most of the people surrounding me, they doesn't have the proper paperwork. An Afghan contractor who worked for Canada says he's tried to reach the airport five times and failed. We're protecting his identity. He wants Canada to send buses to help them navigate the chaos outside the airport. People are running from the tanks. 
and they were uh, beating the people. So it's too difficult. It's a difficult situation. How are you doing, brother? A difficult situation. Abdul Mateen is happy his brother has escaped. I am so happy to come to that country that they're helping and they're so helpful people. He still has many friends stranded, wading through the sewage, hoping to get pulled out. So his work is far from done. Stephen D'Souza, CBC News, Toronto. At an emergency summit today, G7 leaders have agreed on a roadmap to deal with the Taliban takeover of Afghanistan. However, U.S. President Joe Biden is sticking with the August 31st deadline to withdraw American troops from Kabul. As Tessa Arcelia reports, Biden's decision takes into consideration security risks to U.S. forces. U.S. President Joe Biden has decided to stick with the August 31st deadline for troop withdrawal from Afghanistan, a decision after G7 leaders met in an emergency virtual summit. Seven days from now, all U.S. and international troops will have to be out of the country completely, a decision officials say made based on concerns about security risks to U.S. forces. The completion by August 31st depends upon the Taliban continuing to cooperate and allow access to the airport for those who were, trans were transporting out and no disruptions to our operations. In addition, I've asked the Pentagon and the State Department for contingency plans to adjust the timetable should that become necessary. The Taliban had earlier said they will not agree to any extensions and urged Afghans at the Kabul airport to go back home. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson, who convened the emergency meeting, said that the G7 also discussed longer-term plans for Afghanistan. And so what we've, we've done today at the G7 is we've, we've got together the, the leading Western powers and agreed uh, not just a uh, joint approach to dealing with the, the evacuation, uh, but also a roadmap for the way in which we're going to engage uh, with uh, the Taliban. On the ground in Kabul, the pace of evacuations is ramping up. In the last 10 days, nearly 60,000 people have been evacuated, but thousands more are desperate to get out. But with the deadline looming, the UK's defense secretary warned that no nation will be able to get everyone out. Some will be left behind. Tess Arcelia, CBC News, London. The pandemic means Canadians are spending more time at home, but it's also been a time when home ownership has become increasingly unaffordable. On day 10 of the election campaign, federal party leaders are talking about housing. David Thurton takes us through what they're promising. If you work hard, if you save, your dream of having your own place should be in reach. In this campaign, all political parties are talking about the housing crisis. Today, the Liberals promise to create a tax-free savings account for first-time home buyers and bring in more oversight. We'll crack down on the predatory speculators that stack the deck against you. So no more blind bidding. The Conservatives called the Liberal record on housing a failure and touted their own plan. It will free up federal lands and properties to work on supply. It will work on density. It will give first-time home buyers longer mortgage terms to have more certainty. We will work on the mortgage stress test. The NDP is pitching a foreign buyer sales tax and offering a $5,000 grant to renters. Canadians can't afford another four years of broken promises from Justin Trudeau on housing. Meanwhile, the Greens want to see a support benefit for those facing eviction. We have heard from housing advocates that we uh, can expect a wave of evictions when moratoriums are lifted. All the parties are committing to building more homes and they each have their own plan. But whatever the strategy they undertake, this urban planner says boosting supply is key. Building more homes has to be at the centre of any policy platform that is intended to address the housing crisis. Unlike previous election campaigns, we're hearing a lot of leaders talk about housing. It's a sign that this is not just an issue in Toronto and Vancouver, but it's a national one. David Thurton, CBC News, Ottawa. The mask mandate is back as COVID cases continue to rise here in BC. Coming up, we ask a doctor, did the province wait too long? And will the increased measures help curb the tide?
Vancouver's beautiful view is getting a bit hazy, the mountains often blurred by dirty brown clouds. In other words, smog. As Vancouver grows, so does the number of cars, and so does the amount of air pollution. But as our environment specialist Eve Savory reports, there's something new on the road these days, testing stations to catch the worst of the polluters. The spinning wheels, the tailpipe probe, the high-tech gear are all part of the first compulsory emission test in Canada. It's most comprehensive on this continent and perhaps anywhere. Behind that brown curtain are mountains, mountains responsible for trapping the very stew pot that hides them. The lower Fraser Valley has the country's second worst air pollution after the Windsor-Quebec City corridor. 24 hours a day, the monitoring equipment sucks it in. Ground level ozone, carbon monoxide, oxides of nitrogen. You can't breathe. You choke. Asthma is very quick. Ina Greenwood seldom risks going anywhere, and when she does, she takes her paraphernalia and her medication. A weather change can bring on an attack. Smog always does. If it's moving, it's not as bad. If there is no wind, it's the exhaust, probably. Could be a, a, a plant down the road. That's why these people are being trained as inspectors for BC's emissions testing program. Your ETR valve is located under here. After September 1st, no vehicle will get its permit renewed without the $15 inspection and a passing grade. You have failed here on your first idle. Earlier this summer, they opened it up to the public for free as part of the staff training program. And more than 10,000 vehicles went through. One in six had been tampered with. When we had leaded fuel, of course, a lot of people tampered because you can't run a catalytic converter and, have, and use leaded fuel, and those kinds of things, and none of that was ever corrected after we got rid of the leaded fuel. The goal is to cut emissions from all sources by half in eight years. Trouble is, people keep piling in to the lower mainland. We have uh, a million vehicles in, in the Canadian side of our air basin right now. Uh, the population could double in this area within the next 20 to 25 years. In the long term, the district wants to get people out of cars and into buses and onto bikes. In the meantime, it hopes the new program may remind people there are mountains. Eve Savory, CBC News, Vancouver. Managing the COVID pandemic is an increasingly tough balancing act. With back to school right around the corner and a fourth wave rising alarmingly fast, several provinces are bringing back tougher health measures. Katie Nicholson begins tonight here in British Columbia, where hospitalizations have doubled in the last two weeks alone. The last carefree days of summer before early bedtimes and school masking rules kick in. It was kind of hard because like my glasses fogged up, but once I got used to it, it was good. Guidelines announced today in British Columbia require kids and teachers from grade four and up to mask up. It's what is asked. It's just like wearing a seatbelt in the car. You gotta follow the rules. I'm actually surprised they're not doing all mask K to 12. But a much bigger surprise was tucked away in today's announcement. So today I'm announcing we are reintroducing a mask requirement across British Columbia for all indoor public spaces. Not just school kids then, but adults too. A big reversal after dropping the mask mandate just last month. So I kind of like, like that it's not up in the air anymore. And BC isn't alone. Manitoba now also bringing back masks after relaxing its rules. As an additional protection measure against the rising Delta variant and a possible fourth wave, we are also announcing today that we are requiring mandatory mask use in all indoor public places. 
That rising threat prompting another reversal in Quebec. Which today hastily resurrected mask mandates for some schools. And that's why some are calling for even more mask rules for schools. What's more surprising is that the measures aren't stronger and that still other provinces still are leaving it up to uh, school boards or individuals' ch choice. In PEI, harsh criticism that its back-to-school plan was too wishy-washy when it came to masking pushed the Premier to defend his chief public health officer. There's only one thing that has pissed me off, uh, sorry for the vernacular, but is that when our health professionals get attacked like they do. With the fourth wave rising fast, more anger and more rules are likely to follow. Katie Nicholson, CBC News, Vancouver. Well, the order to bring back the mask mandate in BC is a welcome one by some doctors, including infectious disease specialist Dr. Srinivas Murthy, who joins us live now. Dr. Murthy, I want to get straight to it. Let's bring up uh, your tweet from earlier today. It reads, I'm glad BC is now taking things a bit more seriously. What did you mean by that? I think I, I guess I'm surprised people read my tweets, I guess. The second thing is that um, I think this surge over the past few weeks has like, resulted in increasing numbers of cases and obviously we need a response to those increasing cases um, and part of that is the vaccine certificate conversation yesterday and today was the the mask conversation so i'm glad to see these these measures being announced are you satisfied with that response or do you think more needs to be done so like, whether or not it's, it's more in the timing at this point rather than the actual measures um, looking at the case counts rise in the interior a few weeks ago, and it took us until now to implement mask policies. Um, perhaps there was an opportunity to improve things. Um, am I looking for more right now? The conversations right now are mostly in the post-secondary institutions and in the lower grades and whether or not vaccine certificates should be re uh, mandated in post-secondary institutions for students and masks down from K to 3. I'm sure Dr. Henry and her colleagues have reasons for not implementing those. Um, and so we'll wait to see. But you think that that should be implemented in, in post-secondary? I'm, I'm sure it's a, it's a consideration. I think it's a, it's a valuable implementation at this point to reduce in that particular age group, specifically the 18 to 30 range, where the vaccine rates aren't as high as in other age ranges. Um, and so I think it could move the needle a bit to increase our vaccine rates in that range. Well, and sticking with kids, but a little bit younger here, I'm sure you've been watching the states closely and what the Delta variant is doing with kids there. Um, you know, even me as a mom of a baby who can't get vaccinated, it worries me a little bit. So how worried are you that kids here are going to start getting COVID and, and get sicker? Like the thing we can do is, as adults, is increase our vaccination rate. We're at 83 percent. Ideally, we'd be up to 90 percent to protect kids who can't be vaccinated. Obviously, protecting kids beyond that with masks and increased ventilation in schools is something that was announced today, and I'm looking forward to that being implemented. But am I worried? I think I'm partially worried. Yes, I think it might be a difficult fall. Now we're waiting for the pediatric vaccine clinical trial data so we can potentially start getting shots into the arms of kids under 12. What's taking so long with that? Like these trials have to be done very carefully and very well and make sure that the data on safety is especially really robust, to make everyone have confidence in these vaccines. And so they're really making sure that these trials are good. Um, and I'm confident that they will be once they're released. It's just a matter of getting it done and done well. And I, just before we go here, I want to go back to the mask mandate. You know, you mentioned um, the timing of it and the timing of bringing in these restrictions. Do you think that cases would be lower right now? Do you think that it would have made a difference if we brought that in earlier? Like masks are one thing that reduces our overall case count. It's not the only thing. And we have all sorts of different measures that we can implement. Um, and so if we had introduced a province-wide mask mandate a few weeks ago, probably our cases would have been slightly down. It wouldn't have been the magic bullet by itself. Okay, Dr. Srinivas Murthy, infectious disease specialist, thank you. Have a great day. The Northwest Territories is reporting its first death from COVID-19. There are more than 200 active cases right now, and the virus is spreading in remote communities. As Juanita Taylor tells us, territorial leaders are asking for more help on the ground. 
This is going to be just like Christmas. At the Dene Nation in Yelone, staff have been busy getting toys, puzzles and other activities ready to send to remote communities affected by COVID. If you have been in isolation, you will understand because, um, you know, it's long hours. You don't, some people don't have any contact with anyone and, you know, it's good for mental health. Something the 150 people who live in hard hit Colville Lake will appreciate. The common law, my two babies are positive. My baby's been up all night crying, so I had to carry him around, give him Tylenol, and you know, you just gotta deal with it and just keep on going to the next day. And the federal government has sent Red Cross nurses to Yellowknife and asked volunteer rangers in several communities to help. What they're mainly going to be doing is you know, providing the transport, providing distribution of supplies. I think a lot of communities are going to need supplies delivered to people that are isolated. But the territory's health minister says more help is needed from Ottawa, especially nurses. We're at an awkward time with the federal government because of the election that was declared on the same day that the outbreak was declared. I think they understand the urgency and they have already provided some resources. We need more, they know that. Yesterday, another community that tested wastewater found COVID in the samples. The Canadian Armed Forces says it can bring in more resources from outside the territory if the communities request it. But for now, they say they're managing as people pull together to help out their neighbours. Juanita Taylor, CBC News, Yellowknife. Some parts of the country are being overwhelmed yet again by the virus. The Delta variant continuing to be a prime driver of infection, yet other parts of the country are avoiding catastrophe, mostly due to high vaccine uptake and other precautions. One expert warns health systems are still at risk. We can overwhelm our ICU capacity here, and it doesn't, sadly, it doesn't take a lot to overwhelm the ICU capacity. So when you truly have millions of people who are unvaccinated, and we have a very contagious variant and opportunities for this variant to be transmitted, you can't get surprised if you see a rise in cases with a corresponding rise in hospitalizations and the need for those hospital resources. Some of the ways the doctor suggests we can avoid overwhelming hospitals will be quite familiar to most people, encouraging more vaccinations and creating safer indoor spaces. And that can include the use of vaccine passports or other proof of inoculation. He set the tempo for the Rolling Stones, looking back at the legendary life of drummer Charlie Watts. That's coming up. At 6.41, you are looking at a live shot of North Vancouver, some wet stuff and downright chilly temperatures coming our way. Amy breaks it down next. This is the Equalizer Challenge. Andre de Grasse is a Canadian champion sprinter with a personal best in the 100 meters of 9.92 seconds. Jesse Owens is an American legend who took multiple golds at the 1936 Berlin Olympics, winning the 100 meters with a time of 10.3 seconds. It was in 10.3 right there. 10.3, that's in Berlin, yeah. Wow. So how tall are you? 5'10". 5'10", he was 5'10". Uh, and what, what's your weight? I'm 155. I, I think it's about the same. He was about 70 kilos, something like that. If these two men faced each other today, who would come out on top? <laughs> these are the kind of high-tech runners that Andre de Grasse usually wears. But to make it a fair race, we're making him replicas of Jesse Owens' shoes. Look at those. Yeah, really nice. So, how does it feel? It feels good. Instead of a modern synthetic surface, the track will be hard packed dirt, like the one in the 1936 Olympics. Yeah. So, there's your 100 meter straight. You can just see the finishing line down there. <laughs> now, he didn't have any starting blocks. So if you put your fingers down on the line and put your feet where they would go, and then we'll create some holes there, and then that in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. The time for Andre to beat is 10.3 seconds.
So with my hands timing, we've got just dead on 11 seconds. How'd you feel? I don't think I've ever felt so tired <laughs> running 100 meters right now. So, but it does kind of show that that the tracks, the shoes, does make a bit of a difference. Yeah, yeah, you I, said it's... I think it makes a really, really big difference. <sighs> it, it was tough. I think this will show a lot. This will show that Jesse Owens has a lot of strength and, and power. <laughs> wow. <laughs> the strength and power to win this equalizer challenge. The legendary drummer of the Rolling Stones has died just three weeks after the band announced he would not be joining them on their upcoming tour. Eli Glasner now with the legacy. 80-year-old Charlie Watts leaves behind. With the internally exuberant guitarist Keith Richards on one side and the tireless Mick Jagger out front, Charlie Watts looked like a guy just doing a job. But that was part of his genius in the band, not competing with, but knitting its elements together. Besides, try to imagine the Stones' satisfaction without his straight-ahead snare, or the marching tempo driving painted black. I see a and I want it painted black. In one of the world's hottest rock bands, Charlie Watts brought the jazz cool. It seems simple on one level, but as a drummer, I'm telling you, he will open up the hi-hat in places where you don't expect, and he moves the song forward. And, you know, there's not a single song that ends at the same tempo that it begins. Born in London in 1941, he discovered jazz in his early teens, and then in his early 20s, a rock band called the Rolling Stones. But even when it became a global touring machine, the dapper drummer never looked for the spotlight. There's a lot of different things to do. It's interesting, but it's a bit frantic. Ah! For me, it's too much. This music writer says Watts is what kept the Stones together. Charlie was probably one of the only people who could keep them in line uh, and who they both, I am very certain, respected deeply. In 2004, when Watts was battling throat cancer, Keith Richards said, if there's no Charlie, there's no Stones. As the news spread today, rock and roll royalty, Brian Wilson, Joan Jett, Robbie Robertson, and more all sang his praises. Condolences to the Stones. This would be a huge blow to them because Charlie was a rock um, and a fantastic drummer. Charlie! There's no word on whether the Rolling Stones will move forward, but Watts' signature sound, that swinging backbeat, will continue resonating as long as their music is played. Eli Glasner, CBC News, Toronto. Amy Bell is here again for a look at the weather. Okay, a pretty beautiful day today, Amy, yes. but uh, <laughs> not sticking around, is it? No, it's not, but it will return. It's not disappearing right away, but today it was gorgeous. Blue skies, not a cloud to be found, and those temperatures in the low to mid-20s. We will see things getting much cooler overnight. Right now, though, we're still looking at about 26 in Abbotsford, 25 for Pitt Meadows, so uh, definitely a nice evening for you to head into. Overnight, we'll still uh, stay clear, so of course it will be a little bit extra chilly as we make our way into the early morning hours. And then tomorrow, we start off with a mix of sun and cloud. However, as the day progresses, we do head into more cloudy conditions, and 
that is arrive, uh, arriving ahead of the next system just sitting off the coast that will bring some showers throughout the day on Thursday and Friday. For the rest of the province, though, of course, today was gorgeous. And then we're going to see just that slow transition tomorrow. So tomorrow is a transition day. And then we'll get into the wetter stuff for Thursday. Tomorrow, though, you will see it getting wet for the, so uh, the central coast and the north coast and down on Vancouver Island. And then you can see as we head into Thursday, it just continues to move across the province, bringing much needed showers and rain to many areas. We will see some showers in the southern Okanagan where we have seen incredibly dry conditions, but definitely some cooler temperatures in the short term. Taking a look though further ahead for tomorrow, we're looking at 25 once again for Abbotsford, barely that in hope, and then that second half of the day will be clouding over. We'll stay a little bit warmer in the overnight hours though as a result. A uh, mix of sun and cloud for Comox tomorrow, a little heavier on the cloud for Tofino, but you will stay dry until Thursday when the showers do arrive. Tomorrow we're looking at that wet weather hitting the coastlines very early. So Dees Lake has some showers, Prince Rupert and Port Hardy, but everyone else staying dry 22 in Prince George and 26 in Kelowna still a little bit cooler than we typically would see this time of year but for the five-day forecast around here at least we are going to return to the sunny weather for the weekend but before we get there we've got a couple of wet and very chilly fall lake feeling days we'll definitely see a shift so tomorrow starts off with more sun heading into the clouds but it'll actually be a bit warmer tomorrow than we're seeing today dropping down to about 15 overnight Thursday, we'll just see that temperature anywhere from about 16 to 18 degrees, so much cooler than we've had, dropping to 14 overnight. Same story for Friday, but then we start to rebound Friday afternoon, and by Saturday, we are back into the sunshine and those temperatures in the low to mid-20s for the weekend. All right, looking good, Amy. Thank you. You're welcome. The Tokyo 2020 Paralympic Games are officially underway as the city remains under a state of emergency from COVID-19. And as Sarah Levitt reports, the opening ceremony launched the competition in style. Canada! Canada! Headed by para-judo's Priscilla Gagné, Canada's delegation at the Tokyo Paralympics opening ceremony may have been small, but don't confuse that with complacency. I know this, I know the pool. We've got a job to do. You're going to be blown away. 128 Canadian athletes, 18 sports, gold, silver and bronze medals to be won. At the Paralympic Games, it is so exciting to see what's possible with so many different types of bodies and just that human potential, that demonstration of the human spirit. On the mixed gender boccia court, Alison Levine exudes that potential and spirit. Ranked world number one in her classification, she's a high caliber athlete known for her explosive play in a sport where precision is key. And she does it all with a degenerative neuromuscular disorder. It's so hard to put into words the the pride that I feel in that um, to show the world and any any little girl who's watching or anyone with a disability who's watching that you know you can make it here um, you can pretty much do anything even though it seems you know so far off looming large over the event much like the Olympics is COVID-19 for some of the athletes, though, underlying medical conditions due to their disabilities make them at an increased risk. The pandemic has disproportionately affected persons with disability around the world. These games are being touted as the most important Paralympics to date. Now is the moment when they need their voice to be heard the most. And the Paralympic Games are the only global event that put persons with disability at the center stage. So we are giving them the voice the time that they need their voice to be heard the most. You are about to see some of the most incredible displays of athleticism, determination, sheer grit. And all while she wears her signature footwear. Lucky red shoes. Sarah Levitt, CBC News, Toronto. She may live in a remote part of Canada, but the internet has allowed one grandmother to spread her bannock recipe around the world. We'll meet her next. I thought it was my garbage. Joel Martinez is a branch director at this restaurant in Verdun. He says wasps are a big problem and they're chasing some of his business away. In general, people just freak out and they just leave and they don't want to eat around the place. So we try to find different kind of way, move the garbage, put some products, and after that we realize it's just like, it's just crazy everywhere. 
and people are getting frustrated too. This couple was trying to enjoy their lunch on a patio. They are a bit bothering us actually. A common complaint on Wellington Street where people come to eat. So I am petrified of them. I'm quite impressed I haven't gotten up to run yet. Hopmeyer says it seems like there are more than usual, and she's not wrong. This entomologist at Montreal's Insectarium says the heat is playing a role. We notice them more and more as the summer progresses. She says the wasps are kicked out of their nest at this time of year so the queen can hibernate, and now they're searching for nutrients. Eating with, you know, cups of, of juices a bit all over the place and big plates of food, I mean, it, tra it attracts us and it attracts uh, wasps as well. She says people eating out on the street will attract unwanted guests. We have as much rights as we do to enjoy the weather and a nice soft drink and everything else. But for this Verdun resident, he says he's learned to live with them. As long as they don't bother me too much, I'm okay with them being around. Malinarek says the wasp will likely be here until first frosts, and she says as the summers get hotter, we might want to consider getting used to them. Rowan Kennedy, CBC News, Montreal. It's one of the things I've been here, you know, 30, going on 35 years, and it's the first time we've had is complaints like that. We've been contacted by residents with concerns about uh, bees, what's happening during the flight. They're actually leaving droppings, bee excrement, if you would. Uh, and if there are a lot of bees, it, sometimes it presents a problem for some of the neighbors if they've got a certain flight path that go over uh, cars or furn patio furniture, th things of that nature. So they're, they're just little dro just little little pellets, just little yellow. But when they, they, they smudge, and they're, they're kind of hard to clean. Uh, so if you get a lot of them, um, they can make a mess. These are all cap brood. So this is all baby bees here. You know, I've got 16 hives here and <laughs> I don't have any issues. Uh, you're here right now. Uh, you can see they're, they're very gentle. Uh, I haven't gotten stung. I don't think you've gotten stung or anything. And uh, you certainly haven't gotten pooped on, I don't see. So I don't know, uh, I really don't know what the issue is. So one of the items that we would be looking at would be if they have a lot of hives, should there be a, a water feature on the property so that the bees, first thing they come out of the, uh, the hive in the spring of the year, you know, they make a beeline, you know, pardon the pun, to the, to the water source so that they, they have a close uh, source to, that they go to. Um, what that does is it stops, you know, you could have hundreds of thousands of bees and if you have a number of hives making the same path, say, across the neighborhood, uh, and it could present an issue sometimes. As I said, it's, this is the first time we've, we've had it, but um, we really want to be ahead of the curve on this one. Hi, I'm Amy Bell. Here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. Support sustainable agriculture and celebrate local food with Gloria Macarenko at Feast of Fields at Home. Learn more about the Gourmet Harvest Festival at farmfolkcityfolk.ca. And from September 2nd to 5th, enjoy free outdoor performances, a virtual art walk, exhibits and more at the Fort Langley Jazz and Arts Festival. Go to fortlangleyjazzfest.com for more info. A clean kit grandma in the Yukon is getting worldwide attention for her famous bannock. In 2016, Teresa Ward started selling bannock at events around the territory to help make ends meet. It's now five years later, and as Gordon Leverin reports, she's taken an indigenous food item to one of the largest marketplaces in the world. They say Teresa Ward's bannock is one of the best. Now it's a cash generator. And with Amazon on board, millions from around the world will be able to eat a Yukon indigenous food staple. But it had a humble beginning, an idea. It might be something really cool and having it in our stores in the Yukon, you know, an indigenous food into the stores. And we've got so many cultural foods in the stores, but no First Nations foods. So she created a brown paper bag version of her bannock and peddled it to stores throughout the Yukon. Then she joined a startup boot camp offered by Yukonstruck. Three months later, with help from a local marketing and branding company, she caught the eye of Amazon. Having a sales agent that works with me through Amazon is really going to be helpful for me because I, it's so big that it's really hard to even know what to do on there. Bannock has been an indigenous staple ever since flour, salt, sugar, and baking powder were introduced by incoming miners looking for gold. 
Telling the story of it and Teresa Ward fell to another startup company, Shikap Media. Filmmaker Nishka Pajor says both parties knew how important the story is behind the product. It's awesome to see people starting business in the Yukon and being successful. Each story is different. Every story is different. Every story uh, is pretty much amazing. Uh, they start small, they start in their kitchens, they start in the homes, and then they explode. As part of the marketing, Yukon Bannock is made by Grandma Teresa. It's a nickname she had since childhood growing up in Carcross. She says her success is a product of many Yukon companies working together, and she's thankful for that. However, she also says success has to come from within. It's really all about you. If you want to do it, you can do it. And it's just a lot of hard work and a lot of weekends, a lot of night times, a lot, a lot of learning, a lot of training, you know, so it's really being committed to it. Gordon Lovren, CBC News, Whitehorse. And I'm hungry for some bannock. All right, thanks for watching CBC Vancouver News tonight. You can always get our program on demand at our website. Dan Burrett is here at 11 o'clock with your next local news, and we are back here tomorrow. Good night.